Yo, what's up everybody? Another video about kick drums. I feel like I've done quite a few kick drum videos in the past. However, I feel like I finally figured something out for myself. This week, I really hit this huge roadblock when it comes to kick drum sound design. And I came up to this point of enormous frustration. And I remember we're hitting this point several times in the past as well, to the point where I almost wanted to quit making music. And this week, I really feel like I figured something out. So I figure might as well just share it with the channel, share it with you, because if you're watching this channel, you're probably making something like dance music. And if you're making dance music, probably kick drums feature very heavily in what you're trying to do. All right, let me first explain the problem and then the solution. Let's go. Now, when you're trying to make kick drums, there are two main approaches. You either use samples or you try to synthesize your own kicks. And for beginners, I've always recommended using samples because there's so many ways in which you can mess up the kick sound design. It takes an enormous amount of ear training and a very good acoustic situation, a lot of trial and error to be able to synthesize the right kind of kick. So just use samples in general. And that's fine, I still stand by that statement. However, I am a techno producer and a YouTube channel who focuses an enormous amount of their activity on kick drums. So surely you would think I know how to synthesize kicks. And that's a fair assumption, but it's not entirely true. I have over the years run into enormous roadblocks trying to synthesize my own kicks. So like a few weeks ago, I did this video on Fiac, right? And this was the result. I was quite happy with the result, especially the kick, which was like this. Sounds great. I really dig this kick, but you might have noticed and all of these approaches were taking a kick sample and putting them into a rumble rack and then applying all the usual rumble shenanigans that you know from my rumbles video. I come back to this quite a lot. So as a matter of personal pride on my next project, I was like, okay, fine and well with these samples, but I'm going to synthesize my own kick. And I ended up going in circles so much that for two days, I was just sitting here listening, tweaking kicks, trying to figure out how to make it work. And it made me want to go jump out a window. It made me want to quit. It made me say, am I any good at music production at all? Do I even know what I'm doing? What is life? Why am I having a meltdown? Oh my God, someone needs to help me. But the good news is that I didn't stop there. I didn't quit. I continued for a while and I figured some things out. And one of my biggest frustrations when I was trying to synthesize my own kicks was that I was starting from a 909 and that would give me something like this. And whilst that's okay, once you actually take ownership of the sound design of the sine wave that's behind your kick, you get something like this. Very different proposition much more assertive, much more dark and tasty, I would say. And in fact, it's kind of like some things that I learned at the very start of my production journey, but I never really integrated them in a deeper way. And now with the benefit of experience and a good sound system, I have. And so I want to retransmit these concepts back to you. Let me explain to you a few things about kick drums. So maybe the main thing that you need to know about kick drums is that the heart of a kick drum is nothing more than a simple sine wave or basically any shape of wave that moves through the frequencies over time and starts somewhere up high, sweeps down real quick, and then comes to settle at a certain point. This right here, this shape is the heart of the kick. This is what it's all about. This is the thing that you need to pay attention to. A thing that goes boo over time. Now let me make some annotations to this. Ways in which you can go wrong. You can go wrong if this time is too short, then it's too clicky. Then we get only the top and none of the thump at the bottom. Another way that you can go wrong is if this rings out for too long. You want some amount of silence here. That silence is going to be the space where your bass line or your rumble is going to live. This is what we're looking at. You see this? This is a spectrum analyzer that's showing us what's up. I'm synthesizing this kick drum just using the sign preset on the Punchbox VST, okay? So here I can adjust all the parameters to sculpt the heart of this kick drum. I can simply adjust that by bringing in the decay. And as you can see, after each kick, there's some silence. So we just wanna make sure that it feels natural. It doesn't have to be completely spaced out. We just don't wanna go the opposite direction which is that it never stops. I mean, maybe we do. Just pay attention to what your decay is. This is an important parameter on how punchy your kick is gonna feel. That's all. Now, the next parameter is your sweep time. Your sweep time here is how long does it take to come down to the resting frequency? And this one is a little bit of a Goldilocks effect. It has to be just right. A little bit too short and you're gonna get a clicky kick drum where it sounds 
too much like an L, you don't really get a lot of the high frequencies. So you can kind of just hear the mid click and then a subtone, but they don't feel connected. They don't feel connected and so they feel a bit clicky. There is a click in the mid and there is a subtone, but they don't feel punchy. On the other hand, if you go too long, it sounds like a laser. It sounds pew, 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 right? So you need the sweep time to be just right so that it feels like there's a knock that's coherent, that you can feel the heart sweeping down, okay? And now the next aspect is high to low. So frequencies. What frequency do you start at and what frequency do you end at? The top frequency is gonna tell you how bright is this going to sound. So if I bring the start frequency up, you can see it expands all the way up to like 5K or even beyond. And now, thanks to all this, I'm going to have to adjust my other parameters to feel correct. However, you notice how this doesn't, this doesn't sound banging at all. You see the heart of the kick doesn't need to extend up too high because the high frequencies are going to be carried by a whole bunch of different things. Specifically, we're still going to saturate the heart of this kick and we can always layer on top samples that take care more of the transient and the character of the kick up top. But the heart of the kick needs to stay clean and simple and at this point undistorted. Before we talk about that layering or that processing, let's also talk about the end frequency. So your sine wave sweeps down to hit a certain frequency and then it stays there for a moment. And that might be the frequency that people perceive the kick to be at. So a high kick might end more like that and a low kick might be more down here. Depending on your subwoofers or your speaker system, you might not even be able to hear the, the bass frequencies here. If you think that a typical 909 kick has its fundamental frequency at 55 hertz, maybe you want to use that as a reference. Maybe you want to start at 55 hertz and decide if your kick wants to be a little bit lower, it might sound a bit more modern, but if you go too low, you might lose that bass energy on most systems. So you choose a top frequency and a bottom frequency. Fair enough, right? Now, two things that we need to do from this point on because the heart of our kick is more or less ready to go. What we're now going to be doing is we're going to be saturating it and we're going to be stacking some kind of click on top of it to give the ear something to hang on to a bit more in the upper mid frequencies. This is optional and completely up to your taste, but most kick synthesizers do have the option of stacking on top some kind of sample. So for example, let's find ourselves a sample. Nice. So without it, here's the heart of our kick. With it, it sounds like that. Without the heart of our kick, this sounds very mid-rangey and not very thumpy. But now the thump comes back. Let's adjust a little bit our volumes. This sounds pretty good overall, because now the ear has something to hold on to all the way up to nine or 10,000 hertz. And in a busy mix down, this kick is not gonna get lost. How bright or dark you want your kick to sound depends entirely upon your genre. But now one thing you might wanna do, depending on how aggressive you want your music to sound, is saturate this. Let's saturate it a bit. So without the sample, we're just, we've just got the kick. This is the heart of the kick in the lows. This is it saturated. And we don't need to saturate it quite this hard. We can just, we can just blend some of that stuff in, in parallel, add back up our sample. And now we've got something pretty good. So if I drop our rumble rack on top of that, let's see what happens. Excellent. And now from here, with all of this, we can start sculpting. We're becoming sculptors because what we're doing is we're going to keep adjusting our parameters to find more Goldilocks positions. So for example, the end frequency. Hmm. Quite like this. And now we can just keep messing around and tonally shaping our kick. But as we can see, the heart of the kick is intact. We've got some transient information up top. And now we can just have fun. There we go. From here, it just took a little bit of tweaking, a little bit of searching because every kick is unique and 
A kick has so many different dimensions. It's got a low, a mid, and a high, and then there's the rumble. And so you might want to experiment with different types of saturation, different EQ settings. And you might want to check your kick on many different systems, and you may want to A-B check with other tracks because it's so easy to lose perspective on this. However, whenever you're getting lost in the weeds, synthesizing a kick, remember that it all comes down to the heart of the kick, which is just a sine wave. Get that sculpted exactly right, saturate that afterwards, and then start thinking about layering things on top of it. But just get that heart of the kick right. Remember my video on owning your process? Well, from now on, this is how I'm gonna do my kick drums for torque. If that style works for you, go follow my torque profile on SoundCloud and Spotify. Go out into the world and melt some faces with this. If this was kind of challenging to you and you feel like you need to learn more in a systematic way, go follow my Foundations of Electronic Music or Foundations Level 2 courses. Go make yourself some nasty kick drums, go melt some faces, and until next time, stay producing, be good to each other, and take care. Bye-bye.